occasion of the international we are very happy that on the occasion of the international youth day you were able to pull up a, a great a panel of um, extraordinary passionate uh, skilled talented entrepreneurs uh, from Lebanon and uh, they are representative of really the kind of passion, resilience, determination and success that um, the Lebanese can have and can spread to not just the Arab world but to the entire world. Uh, I am really honored to be moderating this panel with our um, speakers Wa'il um, Alaaji, Shada Nasser, Abbas Tidawi and uh, Lin Gandur who will be joining us later. And I would again thank everybody who has been, uh, who's joining us and who registered with us. I know that we have uh, a lot of uh, young aspiring entrepreneurs who will look up to our speakers today and aim to be inspired by them and to walk into their footsteps. So I really hope that today will be inspiring for all of our youth attendees and to our audience more generally. Uh, and I would like to give a shout out to our uh, youth leadership program participants, to our Web for Change participants, and to all our Riada for Social Innovation and Shabab Lab alumni and current uh, trainees and participants. We are always happy to see you um, uh, active in your society and community and uh, aiming to be inspired by role models, by other uh, business players and by really uh, inspiring uh, young business leaders and passionate uh, self uh, young leaders as well. Uh, if you don't know me, I am uh, Mona Aitani. Uh, I recently finished my PhD. Uh, I have been teaching at AUB for 10 years now and I'm joining the School of Business starting the fall as an assistant professor. I'm also the founder of Riada for Social Innovation and Shabab Lab, which are really a two platforms for youth to become social innovators and change makers. We are happy that we have empowered over 2,500 youth so far. And with our e-learning platform, Shabab Lab, we know that we can double this number in just one year time. So um, like really, there is no limits to our dreams and our passion. And this is exactly what we'll be talking about today. It's the passion and passion of well-known um, uh, well guests that have really made change, not just in their own lives, but have made change to the people around them. So I will stop sharing my screen because I would also like to highlight our speakers. And I will start with a very inspiring speaker and I will be uh, introducing the speakers as I go again, this is a panel uh, format, so we won't be just hearing for one person uh, for a long time, but we will be alternating between the different speakers to be able to hear from all and have a nice interaction as well. Um, I would really like to start with um, Shada Nasser, Captain Shada Nasser. I, I, I was uh, really happy that Yasmin has introduced us. Thank you, Yasmin, uh, for that. Uh, I was super honestly impressed uh, with your journey. Uh, with the number of championships that you have pulled, like 13 Lebanese basketball championships, five West Asian basketball championships. You have been three times Arab champion. You have been the MVP of Lebanon for five consecutive years. And uh, on the other hand, you're also a very impressive entrepreneur. Uh, you, you are the founder of Shada Jewelry, but you're also the founder of Play It Forward, which is a nonprofit organization that develops and promotes women and girls through sports, especially basketball in the Arab world. Uh, this is a very a dear topic to, to my heart and I'm sure to a lot of our audience today because we all know how important it is to improve the level of girls basketball in Lebanon and the Arab world and to provide them with an opportunity to compete in team sports while making friends from different backgrounds and cultures and to uh, empower them and provide them with the necessary teamwork, skills, self-esteem, confidence, and spread a healthy sports culture from a very young age. I'm very honored to have you Shada with us. And I would like to start the first question um, with you. I'm gonna pin you so that everybody can, can see you. Um, I would like to ask you, how did you learn about your passion 
And how did you know that this is what you wanted to do? Uh, Awashi, thank you. Thank you so much for having me and for choosing me. Uh, it's a real honor to be here. Um, honestly, uh, when I was very young, my, my father, he loves sports. He, he's a volleyball player. So I was inspired to play sports because of him. Um, I started going with him to uh, like to a village, a small court where we used to play basketball. I was only eight years old. We used to play basketball, volleyball, tennis, and all sorts of sports. Uh, so that was like from from my upbringing, and you know, I I was used to like having someone at home who used to play sports, which was my dad. Um, I learned that I love sports, all types of sports. When I was young, I I really used to go like every day and play sports for a couple of hours. Uh, with boys, with girls, different age groups. Um, then at some point, when I got like, I was like 12 years old, I had to kind of choose which sport I liked. And for some reason, I, I just loved basketball the most, even though I used to play a lot of different sports. And my father wanted me actually to go through, to go and play tennis, because it was an individual sports. But for some reason, I, I just love basketball. I, I can't pinpoint why I love basketball at that age. I don't re really remember. But I think even now with my character, I think a team sports fits me better than, than in the, an individual sports. And I think um, as, you, as you get better, like when, whenever you get better at something, you start liking it even more. So uh, when I was 13, I, I joined the national team for the under 18 national team, both the under 18 and the senior national team. So that made me also love basketball even more. That's amazing, Shada. And um, since we have a lot of also uh, basketball fans today, we also have with us um, Wa'al Ada'ji, who's also, of course, uh, very well known. And um, he is also um, a serial uh, champion. I'm also going to ask her pin so that everybody can see you. Uh, and Wael has won the Lebanese championship five times. Um, he won the Qatar championship for one time, Tunisian championship and the Asian championship, and has been selected as the top five players in Asia, top five players in Africa. He holds a banking and finance degree from LAU, and he is also an entrepreneur, co-founder of FitClick Rehabilitation Center in Lebanon and in Iraq. So, uh, Wael, also, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you for being here. And I would also like to ask you, how do you transform a passion that you have and something that you're really good at into beyond, you know, just a hobby or something that you enjoy, into a career and into something that is prosperous in the future? First of all, thank you for having me, guys. Uh, uh... Hopefully, it's going to be a very nice talk. Uh, to be honest, basketball has been my passion ever since I was born. Ever since I was four years old, I started playing this game, and I'm 26 right now, so it's almost 22 years of playing basketball. Uh, I, I've, uh, I was a, a Riyadi fan ever, uh, when I was young, and uh, Ali Mahmoud, Smail Ahmed, all these old players were, my, were like my idols. Yasmin Kaisi probably knows how much I was crazy about these players because... Her brother was a, was, a, was a teammate for a very long time, and we shared the same passion together. Uh, I used to follow these guys and see what they do and how they influence the world and Lebanon and the youngsters to become better and to make this game as a passion and as a job for themselves. So, uh, you know, like, uh, I was a big fan of them. Uh, when I was 13, 14 years old, I was like, I wanted to make basketball as a job and uh, to, to influence uh, youth uh, with uh, this game, with my passion towards this game. And this is how uh, it started. I was able to, uh, to become one of the best players in my country, and I still have uh, a long way to go. Uh, I want to inspire youth in a good way, in a way uh, where they respect uh, the game, uh, respect their opponents, uh, love their game very well, where they dedicate most of their time in becoming better and uh, perfecting uh, uh, their uh, the craft to the game properly. And uh, hopefully I can uh, keep on doing so. Uh, basketball is basically everything in my life i love basketball and uh, this is my job my everyday job uh, and uh, yeah this is everything uh, so so Wael, on that particular point like at what age or at what point did you feel ready that that you can you know also start 
creating your own business and and also um, like leverage on your reputation and name to become a successful businessman and in, in addition to being uh, you know a basketball a professional player uh, to be honest the way I opened my first business was was funny uh, I was injured and uh, it was really hard for me to go from a physiotherapist then go to uh, go to do, go do the strengthening in a gym and I was like why don't I I create this, this like both things in, a, in one place. And uh, ever since I was young, I wanted to open like something like that related to athletes, related to rehabilitation and where we take care of injuries and uh, take care of uh, athletes' uh, fitness. And uh, every, every, like every penny I made from my first three, four years uh, in basketball, I trusted like my I trusted my feeling about this business, and I was able to open this uh, this rehabilitation center. And now I have two branches, one in Lebanon and one in Baghdad, and uh, we treat athletes, we treat uh, all types of injuries, and uh, I treat myself there every time every time I'm uh, I'm injured, so I can treat myself in the same place and uh, prepare myself for. Uh, uh, every season there. Wow, that's amazing. So it's really a typical like entrepreneurial, uh, you know, story where uh, some frustration or some uh, pain you have turns suddenly into a business opportunity. Yeah, exactly. Just sees it. So thank you for sharing that. Well, and uh, before I go to Abbas, I would like to ask Shada also at what point in time as a professional basketball player, did you feel that you were ready to start a business? Um, like the final years of playing, I wanted like to to like play it forward or to give back to the to the youth of of uh, in basketball, especially girls. I always felt that like like the girls always got like the short uh, part of the stick, so they don't get the the same exposure as guys. They don't get the same television exposure, the same social media exposure, et cetera, et cetera. Especially the ones that are at a young age. So I felt like I wanted to do something for them. It was, uh, I still had one year of playing, it was in 2014, and I decided to, to have Play It Forward. And it's basically a platform to, to have young girls play uh, basketball, um, like share, their, like become friends, like you said, uh, be, um, play some games because they don't play a lot of games at that age. And uh, the, it's the, the whole purpose of Play It Forward, it's just for them to, to enjoy playing sports. Um, it's not like I want to, to have uh, another, um, I don't know, uh, an amazing player. If, if we have another, an amazing player, that would be great. If we have another Shadda or Rebecca or whatever, that would be great. But the whole purpose of it is just for these girls to have fun and just play basketball or play any kinds of sports and like grasp a lot of, um, you know, uh, teamwork or confidence or something and just like have fun playing basketball because uh, especially out of Beirut, it was very tough like to find uh, schools that actually have um, girls, uh, girls uh, who play basketball. It was really tough, um, especially in I don't know, Bar or Jnoub or uh, Tripoli. Or it's it's hard to find teams who actually have girls that play basketball. Yes, we totally relate. And uh, thank you so much, Shada, for sharing the story. I will be having more questions for you, but now I would uh, like to. Uh, move to our uh, third guest, Abbas. Uh, so he comes from a different kind of background. Uh, the rest of our speakers are like either in sports or in dancing, and he's coming from a very tech engineering based background. But the, the, also he shares one thing I believe the rest is the, really the passion, but the passion to robots this time. So maybe Abbas, you'd like to tell us more about how this passion started and how it also transformed into a business. Abbas muted, Mahay. Yeah. Abbas, you need to unmute. Can you hear me now? Okay. Okay, sorry for that. <laughs> so I was saying that I'm very honored and pleasure to be uh, among such champions and athletes, although I'm from a tech background. But uh, as Dr. Mona said, I share the same passion that led me to where I am today. So uh, my passion to robotics started from a very, very young age. 
everyone around me and my family and my friends started to notice that I like to, whenever I have a toy or a new gift, I always dismantle this gift or toy, check all the components, try to reassemble it and check how, how it's operating again. Uh, then when I noticed that I really liked robot, uh, robots, it was around in grade eight or nine, so 14 or 15 years old. I was watching, uh, this is a true story, by the way. I was watching the Jetsons series, uh, which is a cartoon series. And in one of the episodes, I, I saw a, a robot maid that was called Rosie. So Rosie was a robot maid uh, that, uh, that was among the people in the Jetson, in the house of the Jetsons. And it was helping, uh, helping all, uh, all, uh, all the family members in their, uh, in their daily tasks. So this ignited this spark that I love robots. I like robots. I like these thinking machines. And I like to do these thinking machines that could help us in the future. And I imagined a future where we have thinking machines around us and robots that are helping us in everyday tasks and improving our lives. So we're definitely going to this future. I wanted not to only live in this future, but to really contribute in this future and be a part of it. And that was my, my first step into robotics. Thank you, Abbas. So uh, I, I, uh, I have to mention also that Abbas is pursuing his PhD degree at AUB in, in robotics, basically. He has always been an exemplary student, and he has also won international awards, namely uh, the MIT Technology Review Top Innovators Under 35 for MENA region in 2019, and the Forbes 30 Under 30 in 2020. And he's still very young, so I'm sure a lot of more awards await. So we are very happy for you about that. Yeah, thank you. And I also want to mention that uh, I've participated in a space robotics program in Japan, and I ranked first among 87 students from all over the world. And also I participated in programs in Europe where I ranked, I ranked second in, uh, in Italy, namely. So I believe the message here is really to tell all our attendees that uh, no matter where you are, and sometimes we believe that, you know, our geographic maybe uh, location or origin might be limiting to us, but honestly, there is no limits if, if, you, uh, if you let your passion to, to drive you, and of course, in a, in a good way, then you, you might reach places you have never, you have never thought of before. Um, now I want to move back to, to Wael basically and ask you, um, like when you were trying to, um, st you know, start up these businesses, did you feel at any point that they, they might have, uh, they might be distracting you from your main, uh, you know, uh, main job, which is like playing basketball, where people around you support them? What kind of challenges did you face, if any? Uh, to be honest, the biggest challenge I faced is my age. Um, the first business I opened, I was 21 years old. And I had most of the people that worked with me were at least 10 years older than me. So this was really like a major challenge for me to be able to communicate. And I don't want to say like lead people that are 10 years older than me. It's, 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 it was a bit hard, but uh, it never distracted me since it's like part of my job. Uh, I made sure that this business is something I do on a, on a daily basis. It's working out. I work out every day. I do rehabilitation every day. So it was never, um, uh, it was never hard for me to just focus on basketball and focus um, on, uh, on, my, on my job. And I was injured once uh, the, when, when I first opened my business, I was injured. So I, had, I at least had four to five months of focusing on this job, make sure that uh, everything is perfect. Everything uh, is going out smoothly because we travel a lot, and I might not be there for my vision, uh, for my business. I made sure to put to to pick uh, the right people to run uh, my place and to uh, run uh, run the show whenever I'm out uh, of the country. And I was like lucky to find great people that are working with me right now. And uh, so far, it's been amazing. And uh, if I want to ask you about one thing maybe you would change or you have learned from and you do differently if you had to repeat it all again, what would that be? Uh, I mean, I don't know, uh, probably like 
everything's perfect so i wouldn't change anything the struggle during the like opening the business was amazing uh but again like the only hard thing about opening this business was my age. It's, it was really hard. I was 21. So you can imagine a 21 years old trying to tell you, I don't want this. I want that. So it, w- it was hard for other people to process this in, in their minds. So it was hard to give the I don't know how to say it in English. But uh, nothing. It's been, it's been amazing. Really the struggle in the business is nice. Uh, it's more like psychological, the way you, you, you need to, to motivate the people that are working with you. And right now it's been so challenging with the situation of our country. The only thing I would change probably is our country situation, try to get it back to, to normal. So uh, people would like enjoy working uh, again. Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, I wish we all had this kind of magic wand and definitely it would make uh, us uh, like uh, do businesses in a much better way in the way that we envision. Thank you all for that. Uh, Shaza, so basically, um, also, I wanted to ask you, um, what are some challenges you faced when you were trying to, to launch your like NGO or also your business? And um, ha- what have you learned from those challenges? Um, in Play It Forward, um, there were a lot of challenges. Uh, the first one is basically getting, good, getting in touch with schools uh, and like convincing them to, to have their girls team part- participate in a basketball tournament. So that was the first challenge. Uh, if you only take Beirut, it was easy because these uh, schools are usually like, they, they, they're used to playing uh, t- basketball tournaments. But if you go to a larger scope, which I wanted to cover more, some rural rural areas, it was much more difficult to find schools who have girls teams. So that was the most difficult thing, I think, as a start. Uh, the second uh, challenge that I faced, that I also face still today, is like finding uh, sponsors um, who, who really believe in a cause for actually um, helping young girls play, play basketball. Because we don't charge schools anything, we, jo- we don't charge players anything, everything's for free. So uh, we, need, we need to pay our staff, we need to pay the referees, all these stuff. So, so the funding is a very, very, very difficult thing, especially if you want to convince big sponsors or big, big companies to actually sponsor something that's not very entertaining to watch. It's not like a first division game or, you know, it's, it's basically basic basketball and you're just trying to help these girls enjoy, enjoy their, their games. So um, you know, this is still till today, it's very, very challenging. I usually get my sponsors from people who are very close or have the same mindset as me. And it's just very hard just to knock on a door and just get a sponsor for something like uh, an under 18 uh, girls tournament. And, and on that point, uh, Shada, because uh, we, we are all about like social entrepreneurship, social impact. Uh, so why, why did you deliberately choose to, to have it as like a non-profit organization? Like, can you maybe explain a little bit about the rationale behind that? Um, it's just because I've had a very good experience with basketball. I wanted to Im- impact young girls. And I've, I've learned like with my experience, since we started playing very young and I had like, a, I had a very good uh, basketball career path. I was very lucky um, at the time that uh, Antoine Chartier was, he was the Federation president and he used to believe in young talents. So. So I felt like if you want to start like to build or to teach uh, something, the youth something, you have to start at a very like early age. You can't start like with, with 20s or something. You have to start younger. So that's why I chose uh, girls that are in schools. Um, and I didn't, want to, I didn't want to make it hard for them, especially for people who live outside of Beirut. Maybe they don't have the means to pay for something. So I wanted it to be all for free. So and, and my, my whole purpose is not to make money out of Play It Forward. It's just like I want to give back because I love basketball. I really enjoy doing play it forward. And it's not like a, I don't want to make money out of it. It's just that I want to enjoy every part of it. And I just want to give back to these young girls and help them and like maybe discover a talent, maybe just have them make friends, maybe just for them to enjoy basketball, build some confidence, you know, just get out of that, the box kind of. That's amazing. Very noble, very impactful. We also get back to it shortly. Abbas, meanwhile, I know that you, like Kawail as well, started with your business at a very young age. So was that also a challenge? And what might have been other challenges you faced and how did you go about them? Okay, 
So yeah, I started my business at a young age, not uh, as well, but I was uh, around 20, 26, 27 years old. Uh, it was full of challenges. So uh, we, we launched a robotics startup in a region where we know nothing about robots. The consumers, the companies, the governments, the governmental entities, they know nothing about robots and automation and such. So it was a huge challenge. However, we, we tried to tackle this challenge by uh, introducing an advertising robot. So this was our first robot, Felix. Uh, it was a two screens robot that uh, can interact with people, navigate alone inside malls, airports, and such, and uh, display targeted advertising. So it can profile people uh, in front of it, and then uh, display targeted ads that would fit the interests of, the, of uh, these viewers. So uh, the product was launched uh, by the end of 2019, and then directly we had COVID-19. So all the airports, all the malls were closed. Uh, back then we were in Dubai and we had two huge projects, one in Dubai and one in Germany, and COVID uh, hit us. So this was the huge uh, obstacle in front of us. Uh, this, uh, of course, this didn't make us just stop the startup and uh, go search for another thing. But we, uh, we did a pivot in our product. So we introduced here uh, disinfection robots for COVID-19 uh, with, uh, with a Spanish partner, uh, Asti Mobile Robots. And we introduced this robot in the market and we had some success in it. Uh, so yeah, the struggles from the business side are uh, all the way. And also from the personal uh, side, we, we had a lot of struggles in finding the right investors and introducing robots to the market as well as said. So we were, uh, my partner Wasim and I were uh, 27 years old and we're introducing high-tech robots that are made in Germany. We, we ourselves designed these robots and uh, did the software. So yeah, we had some trust issues with the, with the customers, but uh, we managed to prove ourselves in the, in the market till now at least. That's great, actually. Um, I just want to mention one thing that uh, our fourth guest, Celine Randoui, had an emergency, last minute emergency, uh, but she promised that she will join us if she was able to. So that's why I don't want to say she's not going to join, but she's going to be late at least. So in case uh, anyone from the attendees is wondering why she didn't have the chance to talk yet, it's because uh, she didn't join yet. And I really hope that she will be joining very soon. Uh, now I want to talk about uh, some important topic that um, is also part of our current situation uh, in, in Lebanon and some other Arab countries, because I know not all the attendees are Lebanese, but um, like we, we can see that now most of our speakers are, for example, outside of Lebanon, or they had the, to, to also establish their businesses uh, in other countries. Uh, so I want to start with Wael on that and ask you, um, so while even if you are not in your uh, like uh, you know place of uh, birth or you know your place of citizenship, how how what are you doing or how are you doing um, in order to give back to it and how do you see your your like current um, you know career and businesses also serving back and helping uh, you with your bigger maybe mission or vision. Uh... Uh, it's it's been really. Uh, I left Lebanon two years ago, and I started my like international career, officially my international career two years ago. Ever since the situation started to to be catastrophic in Lebanon, it's been hard, uh, lonely. I'm not gonna lie, but uh, uh, being Lebanese in the world is not as hard as you think it is because we are everywhere. Lebanese are. Uh, it was it was hard, but. Uh, seeing a lot of Lebanese supporting me and backing me up every time I was in a game was really nice. Uh, giving back, I was always trying to meet kids there, meet Lebanese kids everywhere I was, trying to help them uh, uh, get better in basketball, uh, spend time with them, play with them basketball so I can just share my passion with them. Uh, uh, it's 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 re it's really hard to play outside Lebanon because we were in I was in my comfort zone around my family in my in my area right now I'm outside I'm uh, dealing with uh, with uh, foreigners with uh, with people that are not from my environment and uh, it was challenging um, they didn't take me seriously first of all as Lebanese because they weren't really uh, used 
to work with uh, Lebanese players outside. They always used to trust Americans, Euro uh, Europeans. They never really had a Lebanese foreigner playing for them. So it was hard for me to to show them who I was, to tell them that, no, you can trust the Lebanese guy. A Lebanese guy is good. Uh, we have a, we have a great basketball in my country. And I'm happy that uh, I was I was able to pave the way to a couple of players, uh, countries from uh, from the GCC started looking at the Lebanese league, uh, trusting more Lebanese players, signing Lebanese players to play in Iraq, in uh, in uh, Saudi, in other countries. Uh, this is how I was trying to like uh, help Lebanese players and uh, youngsters to to grow and uh, play internationally. Yes, thank you for that. I think it's very important. And I want to ask maybe a similar question to Shada as well. So I also know that you're not now in Lebanon, but you still are giving back to the society and the community throughout the different uh, initiatives that you have. So how do you also see this? Um, uh, so how do you see this? How do you, you know, feel about it? And uh, how, where do you see yourself maybe in the medium or the long run? Um, of course, it's it's difficult. It's it's much harder to be abroad and like to have something running in Lebanon, especially that the situation is becoming harder and harder every year. Um, a big uh, thank you to all the team that helped me and play it forward. If it wasn't for them, nothing would have uh, would have been uh, we would we wouldn't been be, have been here. It's been six years that we have play it forward. Uh, this year we did not operate because of the COVID, but next year hopefully we'll be back. Um, uh, yeah, I have an amazing team, really, and uh, a lot of credit goes to them. Maybe I'm Anna Belwaja, I mean, actor, but Sarah, big, big credit to them. Akid, I always want to give back to the community in Lebanon, especially to the to the to, the, to these young girls. I really believe that the youth are will be able to change uh, the situation in Lebanon, and you really have to start young. And this is why Play It Forward, you know, inshallah, will never die, and I will always keep on adding more uh, tournaments to play forward. We started only with an, only an under 18 uh, tournament. Now we have an under 18, under 16, and an under 14 even. Uh, and we also introduced an under 14 boys tournament. So now we have like four tournaments. And I think this is very important. Uh, as for the Arab world, uh, I'd love to have played forward. They need initiatives like this, especially for young girls, whether in Saudi or in Jordan or in Dubai or or anywhere, or in Qatar, uh, we're looking into that. Maybe, maybe in the, the years to come, we will have one or two projects. Uh, maybe one in Jordan, one in Saudi. Um, and I think we, we Kamena, and we want to give this opportunity to young girls in the Arab world because they also suffer from the same um, social, if you want, uh, difficulties that girls have at a young age playing sports. Yes, indeed. And it's very important, as you mentioned, to also know that this problem is spread uh, maybe even in the more advanced world. And this is why it deserves a lot of attention. And what you're doing, honestly, is, is great indeed. Uh, Abbas, so basically on, on that same topic, uh, what, uh, how would you see also yourself uh, serving, not Lebanon, because I know robotics is very, you know, uh, international in nature. But uh, how would you see yourself maybe giving back to your community, to your society, having some impact through your uh, high-tech work in robotics? Actually, uh, myself and Wasim, my partner, we had this mission to first introduce robotics into Lebanon and the region as a market and as a, as a major in universities, uh, as a skill and as a technology. Uh, and also, we were trying as much as possible to keep our development team in Lebanon and to support the Lebanese uh, youth and uh, graduates by doing internships, uh, by doing workshops for them. Uh, so we were trying to give back to our community. Uh, now with the crisis, we had a window of hope at the beginning of the crisis. So as you know, whenever we have an economic crisis, it, it can turn out as an advantage, especially to technology startups or tech-based startups. Uh, because the labor cost would, uh, would go down a little bit. And this uh, would allow us to compete more in the uh, European and in the GCC markets. Uh, now with all the situation, it's, it's getting really hard to, to, keep, uh, to keep going this way. Uh, but we're trying at least to support uh, Lebanese youth with, uh, with internships, uh, with soft skills, and uh, with workshops at least. 
I believe this is very much needed uh, in this part of the world. And I know now uh, a lot of Arab countries as well with their, you know, visions, uh, they are pressing on, on having these like high technologies available at schools, at universities and uh, throughout our lives. So I really hope Abbas, that you and your team will be able to, to have, you know, uh, to position yourself and be able to be leaders in this market, which uh, is, is very, very much needed. In yeah, yeah. I want to add just one point here that uh, uh, as European industries and European manufacturers or startups or VCs, uh, they really know how talented Lebanese are and how skilled Lebanese are. So uh, as I said, I, I said before that our team, our development team is still in Lebanon. However, our business side, so our headquarters and the business side is uh, now based between Germany and Dubai. And uh, we found out that uh, it's, it's really, it's really uh, true that uh, all these European big names, like we're talking about ST Mobile Robots, ABB, uh, BMW and such, they really know how talented Lebanese are and how skilled Lebanese are. So I hope the situation gets better and uh, we can really contribute in pushing this domain uh, more and more in Lebanon and the region. I totally agree. And I believe that talent, human talent is the uh, best thing that we still have. And on that point, Wael, like given all the talent that we have, you know, uh, all the youth the attendees today and those who are following us in our uh, youth innovation programs, how, what would be your advice for them in order to follow their passion, no matter what it is? Because, I mean, of course, you know, according to certain cultures, uh, you know, youth are supposed to go into the, in certain majors or certain careers. So what would be your advice um, in, in that front? Uh, uh, struggle is part of life, part of my game, part of opening anything in, in life so right now in Lebanon the situation is terrible a lot of people are like hopeless but one day the th it's gonna get better we need to just follow our dreams uh, keep fighting keep uh, working and uh, hopefully one day things will turn out good and uh, things will go back to normal we can just follow and live our lives peacefully in Lebanon uh, but I can just say, like, we, we need to keep fighting and fighting and fighting. Uh, personally, I've been through three major injuries in, in my career. Uh, I've had an ACL. I've had a major shoulder injury. And now I have, like, a wrist injury. But uh, I'm, it's part of the game. It's part of life. I keep fighting. I keep practicing. I keep working on myself uh, because this is how we are as Lebanese. We, we keep working. We have dreams. We want to succeed. Uh, we have to keep pushing till the end uh, because we're going to reach our target. We're going to reach our life being uh, a young Lebanese uh, with uh, full of dreams. Uh, I'm never going to give up. I'm going to keep working for myself, for my family and for my community. I, I love that uh, advice. Honestly, keep fighting. Also, this really resonates well with uh, with like the entrepreneurial vision and missions. Like it is a fight, as you mentioned. It's not going to be easy. So people have definitely to keep fighting. Uh, Shada, what about you? Like, how how would you encourage the youth to really like follow their passion and and uh, also transform it into something uh, not just meaningful to them, but meaningful to the society around them. Uh, I know that they are in a very difficult situation now in Lebanon. I think it's been, it's, it's, we all agree that it's the worst situation ever. Uh, but one thing I learned as an athlete is to really, like what I said, never give up on your dreams. Because um, if you're passionate about something, you really work uh, with all your heart, uh, with all your means. And it doesn't feel like work. It actually feels like you're enjoying something. It actually feels like it's, it's fun. It's not only like something you just go to get paid for. So that's really a blessing. Uh, I think I've been blessed with that in basketball. And everybody who really finds a passion that, that cr can create a job for later is really, truly blessed because this is not very, uh, very common. So I, I really tell them that even if they have uh, something they, that they know their passion or they know they're passionate about to pursue it, even if it's going to be very difficult, but it's actually like what I said, it's going to be worth it at the end. The journey is... It should be like the journey and being like having a hard journey should be fun. And when you reach your results, it will actually feel fun later. So I, I really tell them to pursue their dreams. 
uh, even though they're in a very difficult situation, never give up on what you love. And this, this will be uh, like, um, if, you, if you really have your, like your passion become your, your, your job, that would be really a, truly, a true blessing. Then you don't have to work any day of your life. Exactly. <laughs> so, so Abbas, um, I'm sure you have run into students at university who are struggling with finding their passion. Like, do you have any tips for, for like the youth to find their passion? Like you found it in robotics, but like, how do you find your passion? Yeah, definitely. So here I'll be somehow technical or else why am I doing my PhD? So in robotics, uh, we have something called a particle filter. And a particle filter as a very, very simple example, even if you're not uh, tech oriented, uh, if a robot wants to localize itself inside an environment, uh, it has the map of the environment, it cannot know where it is in this environment. Here we apply something called a particle filter. In a particle filter, the robot can consider itself as, for example, 10 different hypotheses. So the robot, the true cause of the robot is here. It can consider itself in 10 different hypotheses. And then by observing the environment around it while, while it's moving, it can reduce these hypotheses in order to get the, uh, the, uh, the location that it, it's more likely uh, to be the true location. This is a particle filter in robotics. My advice is to be like a particle filter. So if you don't, want, if you don't know yet your true passion or where you want to go in life, just discover different areas of interest start analyzing these areas. Uh, you have now huge resources, YouTube, online courses, events like these uh, events. You can listen to inspiring people. You can listen to TED Talks and start observing all these different options and, until you can reach your passion. And when you know your passion or when you get your passion, uh, you know that, uh, that this is your passion. So it's like love. No one can tell you that this is how you define love or this is how you know that you love someone. You just feel it. So you just have to discover different uh, options and alternatives, and you will get into your passion. And after that, when you get into your passion, uh, or you know your passion, and you want to start your journey, here you have to know, in addition to what uh, the, uh, the panelists said, uh, you have to know that you will struggle, and you will, you will fail 10 times before you succeed the first time. And you will have a lot of pivots in your life. So this is the process. Just trust the process. Fight where you can fight and go with the flow where you have to go with the flow. This is actually as an engineer music to my ears, Abbas, like how you applied robotics to real life. And like, I really love it. Thank you so much for this analogy. And maybe I'll have one last question before you open it to Q&A. And I will also start with Wael. Um, so while we all know that uh, today's world is like changing very fast, you know, after uh, COVID and with the, like the huge social media dominance, uh, influencer dominance, you know, everything is changing and it's changing how we see career choices, how we see our passion. And like, again, like all the cultural standards are shifting. How, how do you see this like immense change in the world and, and how do you believe it will really uh, influence the, the world that we live in well, you mean you're talking about social media how social media is influencing the world in a way or exactly. this is what you mean right um, yeah all right so yeah social media i mean people uh, especially with kids uh, they're always on their ipads watching social media and uh, uh, imitating people on social media so i think this is the biggest example of uh, how social media is impacting uh, our world right now Social media starting revolutions in a couple of countries. So uh, this is how big and impactful it is. Uh, and as, as, as an influencer, I try to, first of all, I'm sorry about the dark. I have no electricity at home. So I'm doing this interview in my car. It's okay. So <laughs> I'm really sorry if it's getting too dark in my car. Uh, so uh, I'm trying, my, on my social media, I try to uh, uh talk to kids as much as I can, answer as much, uh, answer as much kids as I can when they ask me questions on my Instagram. Uh, this is how I can help them uh, uh, find their passion, help them uh, with their workouts, with their practices, and be a good example to them uh, because uh, everyone is on their phones. Uh, we're having a conversation on our phones. We're sharing our passion on social media. So it is the new world. It is the new technology. Uh, 
it's it's really it's really important uh, for influencers to have a very good social media page. Uh, so when people and kids go on their social media and follow them, they can find the right content, uh, uh, find the right things they're looking for, and. Uh, I believe like uh, Shada Abbas uh, understand how impactful social media nowadays uh, is. Uh, it's very important. And I try to be as a very good example as I can on uh, my platform. So, so, yeah, thank you for being a, a responsible influencer. I believe this also comes with, with this like title, I would say. And Shada, same question for you. So now with everything like changing so fast, uh, with our, our youth being exposed very early on to, you know, to technology, social media, the world of influencers, how do you see that our career choices are, are changing as we, as we progress? Uh, for sure, they're, they're going to have a lot of shift in their career choices, more like um, some, something on social digital, digital marketing, more stuff like that. Uh, this is normal. Everybody, even us, like we use our phones much more than our parents did. And I think they'll be using much more of their computers and everything they'll be doing online. Um, as for the influence, influencers, I think we just have to be constructive uh, as people and we have to like spread uh, like a good message or make give good awareness for, for, the, for the youth. Like um, I use the Play It Forward platform to actually be engaging in basketball or I also like bring uh, celebrity figures like Wael, for example, to give a, an award and, and play it forward. And I think this is very important, like to have these influencers uh, have a constructive, something constructive for, for the youth and not the other way around. Indeed, and this is really what we hope to see, to be seeing more of. And this is exactly why we, uh, we invited you uh, to this panel, because we believe that you are being uh, like the role model of what an influencer should be, what a champion should be, what a celebrity should be. So thank you again so much for being with us. And I would like to open now the floor for questions and answers. I know that people uh, with us today are very eager to ask some questions. So maybe if we can have some hands raised and, and we can uh, call you in order to unmute yourself uh, and to share. And uh, so if you're gonna type it on the chat, I will be assuming that you, you do not like <laughs> to speak up. So for others asking, is it a coincidence that all speakers had a young age passion that they worked on? I mean, they are all gifted. What do you say for youth who are not fortunate to have had or discovered a talent since childhood? So I will actually uh, leave it up to the panelists to, uh, to share this. So who would like to go? Uh, I'll go. Sure. <laughs> I think you, when you're young, you just need to try different things. It's not like, I, as I said, we were very lucky to discover what we love at a, at a young age. So you have to be open to trying new things and hopefully you'll know what your passion is. But you really have to have an open mind on trying different things, whether, whether it's a sports or a music instrument or reading or writing or anything. So you just have to be open and like try different things until you really like your passion or really find your passion. And sometimes people go all their life and they don't, but that's okay. But I mean, you really have to try. Yeah, Abbas wanted to say something. Yeah. I think, uh, so personally, I think that everyone has a hidden passion inside of them. So it's only a matter of discovery. This is, that's why I gave this example uh, before. So it's just a matter of trying different things, uh, getting introduced into different topics, different fields, uh, so you can find your own passion and your own goal in life. So it's, it's more of a goal of, in life than the passion that comes uh, along. So if, if you can't find your passion, just search for your goal in life, and then you will, you will go with the flow. Exactly. I believe, Abbas, that we might call it different names. And it doesn't really matter what you call it, whether it's a passion, it's a purpose, it's a goal, it's, uh, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I believe we can call different things. Uh, well, do you have any answer on that? Uh, I think Shada and Abbas said it perfectly. They left me nothing to say. So <laughs> I agree with everything they said. Uh, especially Abbas said, like, Everyone has a passion. You just have to try everything. The same thing that Shada said. Uh, it's a matter of time until you find what you really love. 
but uh, you need to try everything, be open to everything, and one day you're going to find what you love and uh, just uh, go uh, with that. Exactly, and maybe, uh, I mean, we can explore multiple things at the same time. So I, I, I was like fascinated when I was reading your bios, like even a lot of the professional basketball players, they have actually attained, you know, uh, uh, higher education, sometimes master's degrees, like it doesn't have to be like, you know, I left everything and just focused on one thing, right? Uh, so I think Ali has a question for Abbas. So would you like to unmute yourself and ask it? Ali Ismail? Uh, hello. Uh, so my question is, uh, I am a high school student, so I'm really interested in robotics and all of coding and all the stuff. Uh, and I took few uh, uh, few robotics courses online and hands-on uh, and hands-on experience like competition and so. But I still have the uh, feeling that I'm not good enough. So what I can do to improve the, uh, my skill in this is, uh, in robotics. Uh, it's a good thing that you feel that you're not good enough. I personally think that I'm not good enough. Whenever you feel satisfied, this is your end game. So you should never feel satisfied. You should always aim for more and aim for more. As a high school student, you can start with, uh, as you said, so you have to start with learning programming at least, uh, Python, C++. Python is a good start. It's a, it's a really good start. Uh, now we're seeing a lot of initiatives here in Lebanon, uh, Shabab Lab, uh, Dr. Mona uh, can help you more in this. Uh, also, we have different startups working on workshops, on uh, training programs, on uh, job shadowing for, uh, for high school students. So uh, just keep focusing on what you're doing, uh, learn programming and do uh, some um, hands-on experience. So get your hands dirty, uh, get yourself an Arduino, a Raspberry Pi, start doing small projects. Uh, as much as you can uh, improve your skills in programming and in hands-on, you can reach better places. And uh, you still have time. So my, myself, if, uh, if I was or if I have learned uh, programming since I was in grade 11 or 10, uh, I would be in a totally different level now. So uh, consider this as an opportunity. Uh, work on your soft skills and you will definitely reach. And never be satisfied. So... Don't, don't consider it as a bad thing that uh, you, you're not feeling that you, you're, uh, you are where you want to be. So exactly, you. having this desire for like to attain high achievement is always good. It's a good thing. It will keep you going and but never say like, I'm not good enough because you are like, you just have to give it all you have and you will reach there. Uh, so I believe a question that is suitable for both Shada and Wael and it's also about like reaching, you know, like, top heights like did you wish uh, to play for the NBA and and um, like how did you feel maybe um, when it didn't happen that's from the from the chat <laughs> Shada you want to start doesn't matter yeah ladies first go okay. <laughs> so as a player you always want more especially when you're at a young age but if I look back on my career, like I wouldn't have changed anything, even the injuries, everything I went through was amazing. Uh, playing in Lebanon was, was very nice. I also had uh, some opportunities to play abroad, but I, but I rejected them. Um, looking back, maybe this is some one thing maybe I would have liked to try, but um, all in all, I love the journey, every part of it, uh, playing in Lebanon, playing for the national team. Uh, playing in India, playing in Japan, it was all amazing. And yeah, like you always want to reach higher goals. Uh, for us, like for the Lebanese national team, we've played twice in Asia. Uh, we ranked sixth one time and we ranked fifth. And I think that was the best uh, ever till, till today that we've reached uh, like Lebanon. We put Lebanon to be the fifth in Asia in basketball. And that's like a, a huge accomplishment if you want to compare our resources uh, in comparison to the to resources of China or Japan or Australia or all these big, big countries who play in the Olympics. So I think with our such limited resources, we did super well. But um, all in all, I loved every part of my journey. Um, but you're always more ambitious. You, al you always want to try to accomplish more. But if I look back, I'm, I'm really satisfied with, 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 what, with what I've done. So why... Uh, but, 
Uh, as uh, Shada mentioned, with the resources we have in Lebanon, it's it's really hard for us to go play internationally and reach such levels like go to the NBA. I was lucky I was able to get a taste of the NBA when I participated with the Dallas Mavericks in the Summer League. And unfortunately, I was invited by the Golden State Warriors this summer to participate with them in the Summer League. But I'm, I'm injured currently and I wasn't able to go there. Uh, but um, I, wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't change anything in my career. I still have a long career ahead of me, but uh, I have other chances. Uh, I've, I w- I'm, I'm so lucky I was able to play outside Lebanon. I've played in Qatar, I've played in China. I've played in Tunisia and right now I'm going to play in Kuwait uh, you just got to keep dreaming and uh, see, like go hard at every opportunity that comes your way because you never know who's watching you and where you might end up one day uh, you might get a chance I might get a chance again to go to the summer league another year and uh, go to the NBA uh, you just I you just got to keep dreaming and uh, work hard on uh, your goal because uh, uh, the sky's the limit. So thank you, Leonard, for this question. And thank you, Anshada, for the answer. And uh, on that, I would also ask the question of Sidin. Have you ever thought of quitting? And what was the turning point that made you change your mind? So this is for the three, three panelists. I would like to start. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll start. Uh, I feel like quitting off, uh, like in within every injury. Uh, my first injury, I was I was okay with. My second injury was really big, and I really felt like quitting because uh, it was really hard on me. It was it hit me hard psychologically. Uh, but every time I used to look at my parents' eyes, uh, look at my dad and my mom and the people that love me, I would say to myself, "There's no way you quit because if you quit." You quit on them too. Uh, they've raised me. They've helped me on every single thing. They they were there dreaming my dream. And my dad used to take me everywhere I want to practice. The same thing goes to my mom. So they were the turning point on every time I thought of quitting. They were there for me. So uh, every time I look in their eyes, I would say to myself, there's no way I quit. Uh, I have to keep going. And the struggle is part of the game. Injuries are part of the game. Uh, there are going to be a lot of obstacles in my way and I have to climb them every time. Awesome. Yeah. Well, actually, and uh, I also have, I have several reasons not to quit, but I also uh, want to, to assure on something that every entrepreneur or every successful person would go with the series of failures and successes and it's, it's a part of the process again. So with every failure, I, I might think of quitting. But as well said also, I have uh, my family reason. So, and this was the first hit that I got uh, when I was young. Uh, when I finished my mechatronics uh, degree in engineering, I wanted to go continue my PhD in one of the top 10 universities and I, uh, worldwide and I, I was accepted there. A few weeks before my travel, uh, my dad passed away. So this was a huge, a huge reason to quit. However, I, I turned this into a motive, and this, this is currently my main motivation. I always want just to continue my path because I know that my dad was the first supporter that I should go within this path. So you should always, you will, you will fail a lot, you will think of quitting a lot, but you should always remember the main motivation and always just look at your goal and you can overcome any obstacle. And just trust the process and know that you will fail and you will always think of quitting, but just keep your eyes on, on your goals. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, Shada. I just want to add one thing that Abbas and Wa'al said. I believe every person goes through a point in life where he, he feels he wants to quit, but it's just like your perception about it. So so I think as athletes, we, we got used to like getting out of, um, situations like injuries or having the mindset for me it was like uh, it's it's more like a challenge so every setback is is now I look at it I perceive it in a different way I don't perceive it anymore as wanting to quit when I was younger I perceived it as wanting to quit but now I perceive it as a challenge and how I want to overcome this challenge uh, so we all go through this but it's just a matter how, how you perceive it and how you move forward yeah, I totally agree that it's a mindset and that we decide how we want to think about it. 
so Omar is also asking a question related to robotics and computer science. And I think this is part of, again, like all the advice we, we get from, from the surroundings. Like for example, in Lebanon or in the Arab world, it's easier to get into software engineering rather than robotics. What do you have to say about that, Abbas? Read the question first. So I'm um, computer science student and I'm interested. Yeah, so robotics as a career, it's uh, it's both, it's software and hardware. Uh, and you can choose whether to, to work in, in one of these two fields. So as a robotics software engineer or robotics hardware engineer, or just combine both as, as a mechatronics engineer, uh, at least. So uh, what you have to do is, you have to think about your passion again, and you have to follow your passion. My personal advice is to, to step into software first. So software, uh, it's, it's not easier, it's, uh, it's really hard, and the development is hard, and it's a long process. But uh, so if, if you can think, uh, the current advances, the mechanical systems are mature enough. So the current limitations in robotics, it's not only, or, or the, the major limitation in robotics is not hardware, it's really software. But from, from a hardware level now, we can, we can construct any type of robots that, uh, that we want. We can uh, construct a transformer. Uh, we can construct a, ro a robot that would go to space, but the development and the software is, is what really, uh, really differs. So, and this is why we have these huge advances right now in artificial intelligence and machine learning, because uh, the uh, robotic scientists are trying just to get robots as close as possible into human thinking and imagination and, uh, and cognition and such. So uh, as a personal advice, uh, I would advise you to go into or to step into software, but uh, try working in hardware a little bit. Maybe you, you will find it more fun or, or you want to, to really work in hardware. So try both, but software uh, is, is a huge or or you have huge opportunities in software in the in the near future, especially in regions uh, like Lebanon and, and our region. So, because hardware needs a, needs a huge burn of money in order to construct stuff. Thank you, thank you, Abbas, on that. And since we uh, need to be closing soon, uh, I, I would like maybe to have a final word um, from the speakers and and also touch upon the last question that we got which is um, what would be your advice for, for the youth uh, who are interested in, in discovering their passion and their future career path? How would you advise them to, to get their hands dirty early on, if I want to say, to have a glimpse of, of real life and what, it, what they might want to do in the future? So maybe let's start with Abbas, Shada, and Wael. Uh, we'll end with you. My answer will also be technical here, so uh, that's uh, because I'm from tech background. So uh, it's it's really very very important first to discover your passion, set your goals, always set goals because you cannot really go through the struggles and the obstacles if you're not setting your goal. And most importantly, make use of the resources around you. So now we have the mobile phone, we have Wi-Fi, we have YouTube. You can, you can really go, uh, go through the whole process of, for example, building a robot and programming it only by, by viewing YouTube videos just to get this, uh, this sense of how things work. Also, we have the online courses. You have a huge resources of, uh, of free online courses that you can discover and go through. Uh, you have initiatives like Shabab Lab and other startups and initiatives that can support you to the maximum by introducing you to successful entrepreneurs, to successful scientists. Uh, you can attend webinars online. So the world is open. You just have to, to go uh, grab your phone and, and start uh, digging around. This is my, uh, my advice. Thank you, I totally agree. Shada, what about you? Uh, I think they, they should be curious and they should try new, new things. I don't know, volunteer somewhere, uh, watch a seminar, uh, knock on doors. Try different things so they actually know what they like. And the sooner they start, the, the better idea they can make on what they like, what their passion might be, uh, what to pursue in, universe, pursue in universities. So Anna, I say in summer, they should try different things, whether it's sports, whether, I don't know, 
going to, and like volunteering in a summer camp, anything, anything would help. They'll learn by going anywhere. They'll learn, they'll have, they'll learn something, whether it's a good thing or whether, for example, they don't like this. At least they know now that they don't like this path. So just knock on doors, be curious, ask questions. And the earlier you start, the better. Do you accept volunteers that pay it forward? Yeah, for sure. Of course we do. So you can also contact them. <laughs> yeah, I keep. I love Sala. Uh, well, any also closing words and your advice on how to get your hands dirty early on? Yeah, they have to get their hands dirty. That's for sure. Uh, they have to knock on all doors, uh, seek every opportunity that comes their way. Uh, don't be shy. Uh, throw yourself out there. Uh, you might, you might, you're going to fail a hundred times. You're going to fall seven times, stand up eight. Uh, most importantly is not to give up. Uh, again, like I've said it a hundred times, but it's the truth. Just keep fighting. Uh, and you're going to get what you want one day, uh, maybe in a year, two years, three years, 10 years. But if you believe in something, you have to do the impossible to reach your goal. I'm sure that what you said has resonated. Also, Elena has shared with us on the chat uh, YouTube song, uh, Keep Fighting. So I also invite everyone to, to, to watch it and be inspired. Uh, definitely Keep Fighting is the maybe summary of, of the session today. Uh, I would really like to thank our panelists. Unfortunately, Lynn uh, couldn't join us. I hope we will be able to talk to her on, uh, on another uh, opportunity in the near future. Uh, I, I would like to thank again Al Alaji, our very own Lebanese uh, basketball champion. Also, Shada Nasser, it's a pleasure to meet you, honestly. Thank you. And again, thankful for Yasmin to have introduced us. I'm sure we can collaborate also in the, in the near future. Uh, very impressive work, very inspiring role model. Um, thank you for being you and being a, a positive influencer. And last but not least, also our very own uh, PhD student at AB Abbas Sidawi uh, for all the passion in robotics and uh, also influencing the young generation to dare uh, to take on careers that are not so popular, I would say, yet in the Arab world. Uh, thank you so much. I would also like to give a final shout out to the AUB Innovation Park where uh, we are today and to the Beirut Digital District where we have 24-7 AC and electricity. Thank you so much for that. Thank you, everyone. I hope you enjoyed this panel. Um, it is uh, being now recorded on YouTube, on uh, sorry, Facebook, so it will stay there on our Shabab Lab page and we will be uploading it soon on our YouTube channel. Thank you so much and stay safe, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.